Okay, ladies and gents, uh, it's wonderful to have you here this evening. Um, welcome, and I am particularly pleased to welcome tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Camarada. Uh, I've gotten to know Dr. Uh, Camarada over the last several years. I believe he attended the first Prairie Troubadour that we ever had. Is that, is that yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, sir. And I've gotten to know him better with each year. And this last fall, he was my uh, sponsor in bringing me into the uh, Order of, of Malta, for which I'm very grateful. So he's been uh, a good friend and, and benefactor to me and to this place uh, for, for several years. Uh, Dr. Camarada hails from Southern California and the plains of Western Kansas. He completed his undergraduate degree in both Italian and biology with honors at Stanford University. He obtained his MD at the University of Kansas Medical School in 1986. Dr. Camarada completed an internship and seven year neurosurgical residency at the University of Minnesota. As the 38th American College of Surgeons Scholar, he spent two years in basic research on the treatment of experimental Parkinson's disease in rodent and primate models. After residency, he was a fellow in cerebrovascular and skull-based surgery at Minnesota, and then remained on the faculty and directed the cerebrovascular laboratory. After several years, uh, years on the faculty at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Camarada returned closer to home and extended family in the private practice of neurosurgery in Kansas City. As the first surgical director of the Mid-America, now St. Luke's Brain and Stroke Institute, he was instrumental in building an advanced practice of neurosurgery and skull base and cerebrovascular surgery at St. Luke's. During 10 years of service on the executive committee of the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, he completed three years as treasurer. Dr. Camarada's surgical interests are in the treatment of cerebrovascular disorders of the brain and tumors of the skull base. Since arriving at KU, the health system has regularly made the U.S. News and World Report list of top neurology and neurosurgery programs in the country. He has served as a principal investigator in a number of national clinical research trials and is currently serving as a section editor of the Neurosurgery Open Publication, a director on the American Board of Neurological Surgery and is past president of the Neurosurgical Society of America. For 37 years, Dr. Camarada has been married to Karen and they are parents of three grown children. From 2005 to 2012, he produced the popular podcast, The Saint Cast, with over a million downloads of his 142 programs on the lives and stories of Catholic saints. Active in Catholic scouting, Dr. Camarada has received the Bronze Pelican Award and the St. George Medal, given by the National Catholic Committee on Scouting to an individual who has been instrumental in helping Catholic scouts advance in their faith. In October 2013, he was invested as a Knight of Magistral Grace in the Solemn Military Order of Malta, and as a Grand, excuse me, as a Knight Grand Cross of the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem. Dr. Camarada serves currently on the board of directors of the Envoy Institute, a Catholic organization for defense of the faith, and is on the medical and scientific advisory boards of the Brain Aneurysm Foundation and the John Paul II Stem Cell Research Institute. He is the current Vice President of the Cosmos and Damien Guild of the Catholic Medical Association in Kansas City and advisor for the KU Catholic Medical Student Association chapter. His hobbies include hagiography. What is that, gentlemen? Anybody know what hagiography is? JP? Study of holy things, study of saints. Good. Adios. Classical piano, <coughs> jazz, bass, astronomy. We owe our telescope to Dr. Camarada. Gardening, backyard birding, and bonsai. Bonsai. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Paul Camarada. Thank you, Dan.
Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Curra. <clears throat> From a fellow confrere, that is uh, that is uh, is really um, really an honor. And thank you. That'll take up all the time of my talk. We'll see. You next week, actually, um, let me. Uh, I'm going to see if I can get my having trouble seeing my notes up here. So this could be a problem. Um, get one second here. Let's see. View. Play. Here we go. Okay. Presenter notes. Okay. Anyway, um, I think I think it's working now. Great. Uh, I, I want to thank you very much for the kind introduction. My wife, my wife told me tonight, don't worry about what you're going to say. Don't try to be too charming, too witty, or intellectual. Just be yourself. <clears throat> Um, the, uh, as a neurosurgeon, I really have the privilege to uh, work daily on what I consider really God's supreme handiwork every day. I have to remind myself never to take myself uh, too seriously. Um, so we'll start off with a couple of, couple of jokes. How, how do you hide a $100 bill from an orthopedic surgeon? Put it in a textbook. Okay. Um, how do you hide it uh, from a radiologist, you know, someone who takes x-rays? Uh, tape it to a patient, okay. <laughs> Penelope will understand this, yeah. How do you hide a $100 bill from a plastic surgeon? Uh, you can't, uh, that's a trick question. That's a <laughs> How do you hide it from a neurosurgeon? Tape it to his kid. <laughs> How many neurosurgeons does it take to change a light bulb? Uh, just one, the surgeon holds the bulb and the world spins around him. That's right. And finally, the difference between God and a neurosurgeon. At least God doesn't think he's a neurosurgeon. <laughs> Brings me to the story of two of the biggest intellects in the world at one time, Joseph Ratzinger and uh, Bibi Netanyahu, uh, Prime Minister of, uh, of Israel. Uh, one day, uh, the Pope met with his cardinals to discuss a proposal from uh, Mr. Netanyahu to trying to try and bring the faiths together, a little ecumen ecumenism. And uh, your holiness said one of his cardinals, Mr. Netanyahu wants to challenge you to a game of golf uh, to show friendship and ecumenical spirit shared by the Jews and the Catholics. Pope thought this was a good idea, but he'd never held a golf club. This was obviously the previous Pope Benedict. Don't we have a cardinal who could represent me? And uh, None that plays very well, one of the cardinals replied, but there's a man named Jack Nicholas. Uh, he's an American golfer, devout Catholic. We can offer to make him a cardinal and then see if he could play Mr. Netanyahu as your personal representative. In addition to showing our spirit of cooperation, we'll win the match. So everybody agreed, great idea, the call was made. Of course, Nicholas was honored to be made a cardinal, agreed to play. The day after his match, however, uh, Cardinal Nicholas uh, reported to the Vatican to inform the Pope of the result. He said, Your Holiness, I have some good news and some bad news. Tell me the good news first, Cardinal Nicholas, said the Pope. He said, Well, Your Holiness, I don't like to brag, but even though I've played some pretty terrific rounds of golf in my life, this was the best I had ever played by far. I must have been inspired from above. My drives were true and long. My Irons were accurate and purposeful. My putting was perfect. I played like I was 30 years old again. With all due respects, my play was truly miraculous. And what's the bad news, the Pope said? The bad news is I lost to Rabbi Phil Mickelson. <laughs> anyway, it was uh, Michelangelo Buonarroti who said, Destia me quest'anima divina e poi l'imprigionasti in un corpo debole e fragile, come triste viverci dentro. You gave me this divine soul, and, uh, and then you imprisoned it in a weak and fragile body. How sad <coughs> to live there within it. Perhaps it was this prison that he was depicting here in uh, one of the young slaves. This was a sculpture that uh, I believe is in the Accademia in Florence 
where Michelangelo was asked to create a number of sculptures for uh, the monument of Julius II. And you can almost see that the slave is, is trapped in the stone trying to get out. He later remarked, uh, il core è veramente la casa dell'anima. The heart is truly the house of the soul. And of course, he's only one of countless famous and not so famous individuals who've pondered the seat of the soul. What is the seat of the soul? Descartes famously uh, thought that the pineal gland might be the seat of the soul. I had a pathology teacher in med school who thought the kidney was the seat of the soul. <laughs> So I'm not an eminent neuroscientist nor a philosopher, just a what I consider a carpenter blessed with pretty steady hands, and I really am in awe every day uh, to work on one of the supreme masterpieces of God's creation, the human brain. So in this talk I want to give you a glimpse into my path into neurosurgery, what I do on a daily basis, and then ponder a bit on the soul, the immortal soul, its relationship to the brain. And we'll take a look at what some say is evidence of an afterlife, of a soul that lives on after our death through near-death experiences. I had the opportunity to participate a few years ago in an amazing uh, video series with uh, Chris Stefanik and the Augustine Institute out of, um, out of Denver. It was called The Search. And one of the leaders uh, in this organization called Legatus saw my appearance there. Uh, they interviewed me about the seat of the soul and and the brain, and thought I might have interest, something of interest to share. So as a physician and surgeon, I see suffering and death uh, really on a daily basis, and illness and its impact on families, society, individuals. Without really some grounding in the faith, I really don't know how uh, my colleagues uh, who are agnostic or atheists really get through the week. Brain tumors, uh, literally horrible traumatic illnesses, people stricken in the prime of their lives with massive strokes. Uh, but I also consider myself incredibly fortunate to be able to participate on a daily basis in a, in a corporal work of mercy. Um, by way of my background, Mr. Kerr mentioned I had a special connection to saints. I produced a podcast a number of years back, back before podcasting was cool and, and everybody was listening. And uh, there are a number of them still available on the website, saintcast.org, um, which you could go to. I don't have it connected to Spotify or any of the others, but a number of saints I kind of look to to emulate um, in my daily life. And I'll allude to a few of them. Uh, I, I owe this, uh, this, I just mentioned a little quip uh, echoed once by a friend of mine, Pat Madrid. Patrick Madrid's a, a, a very popular Catholic uh, apologist. And uh, he, he saw a statue of Our Lady of Fatima and the three children uh, kneeling down in front of her. And he goes, gosh, I love being Catholic. Not only can we worship statues, but our statues worship statues. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I was born in Orange, California, the oldest of six children. Uh, I was born again on July 10th. I was baptized by Father Michael Moran. Uh, one of, how many here know the date of their baptism? Very, very important, a very important date. And one of the things I heard uh, from a priest once was when you, next time you pray the rosary, pray the five decades, the first decade for the priest who baptized you, the second for the uh, priest who gave you Holy Communion, the third for the bishop uh, who gave you confirmation, the fourth uh, the uh, priest who married you, witnessed your marriage, and the fifth for the man uh, who will bury you. Uh, I went to St. Catherine's Military School in Anaheim, California, kind of a uh, uh, you know, non sequitur, a Catholic military school. It was run by uh, Dominican nuns and retired military. I, I, I lost my glasses. I wore glasses in first grade. I left them on the parade grounds one day, and I went to the commandant's office the next day. Sir, <clears throat> lost my glasses. What's your name? Cadet Camerata. Drop, these are glasses? Yes, sir. Drop and give me 20. <laughs> Down one, down two. I can't hear you. I was six years old. I mean, probably this big. Uh, but a great, great school. Uh, two parents, deeply religious parents from a Sicilian immigrant family and a German-Russian immigrant family. Um, went to Catholic schools my whole life. My dad got sick, got cancer when I was uh, eight and decided to move to Kansas, which is where my mother was from. So we moved to Hayes, Hayes America. Um, when uh, my dad finally died when I was 14, I was the oldest of six children. My youngest 
sister was uh, four at the time, but my mother was near her, her family, which was dad's reason for moving back. I grew up heavily influenced by the Capuchin Franciscan Friars. Uh, Archbishop Chaput was one of my teachers in high school. Uh, was in the Capuchin Formation Program uh, for a while. Um, so you see a lot of the Capuchins here. Father Regis Scanlon was a really close friend, married my mother um, for her second marriage after my father died. Um, uh, the saints that I was interested in therefore started with Francis. So this is the likeness of Francis that is perhaps that is recognized from people who saw this as the likeness that was most like him. So it was done by an artist named Chimabue. It's a fresco in the lower basilica in Assisi. And everybody you know, who saw Chimabue paint that said, well, that's Francis. That's what he looked like. So uh, you could see Francis right here. And I had a particular attachment through him, through the poor friars that, that uh, taught me. And to paraphrase Archbishop Chaput, Francis wasn't a, you know, a panty-waist, peace-loving you know, uh, hippie he, he, that many think he was. He was a man who set out to reform the church, you know, uh, which was becoming more and more decadent at the time. He was really a, a radical. Um, you, you go to Assisi nowadays and you can see relics of France and still have his habit there that he wore, you know, 800 years ago. And it's just, first of all, he was really short, like shorter than, than I even. <laughs> and, and the habits, like, got, must have 150 or 200 little patches on it. He probably wore the same habit, you know, for 20 years. Um, uh, Thomas More, I went to Thomas More Prep. Uh, anybody know who Thomas More is? Lord Chancellor of the Realm, who died for. Uh, conscience was beheaded. Um, I went to college at Stanford, majored in Italian uh, and biology, and by the grace of God, never lost my faith. Uh, I became a broadcaster uh, in Hayes, Kansas. I'm not sure if this will. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. Anyway, that's when I had hair and it was dark. That's <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty funny. I'm going to see if I can con connect the, uh, the audio to this just to make sure that when, when I play a couple of videos, the audio works real well. So, um, All right, output Samsung. There we go. Okay, so it'll come through the television. And there, there probably is a volume on the, on the TV that we can turn up. So I went to med school at KU four years. I got married, did my honeymoon in... Uh, Italy, uh, went to visit my cousins in Sicily, um, and how through four years in you know, decadent California, Providence steered me to the wonderful woman that uh, became my wife, Karen, then began my life as a surgeon at the University of Minnesota. Um, and back in the day, this was a pretty, pretty rough uh, start to a, you know, to a life, and I had just, just gotten married. Uh, I'll give you an example, my first year, so I got married in May, started my residency in June, and was on call every other night for three months. So, meaning, you know, I go to the hospital at 6 a.m., stay there all night, sleep all night, stay there all the next day till 6 p.m., go home, sleep, and then start it again the next day. So, um, a tough way to start, start a marriage. I remember having Christmas Eve in a, in a call room with my wife. Um, so, it, it, was a, it was a tough go. It took uh, eight years, residency and fellowship. Um, and as my wife said, I spent 10 winters in Minnesota. Um, since then, I, I would guesstimate I've performed thousands of surgeries on, the, on people with brain tumors, spinal problems, traumatic injuries, uh, brain aneurysms, cancers, and other disorders of the brain. And I can't tell you how emotional and awe-inspiring it is to be able to meticulously repair things, remove tumors, place tiny little clips in the brain on aneurysms, and have these same humans uh, with souls wake up after anesthesia uh, knowing that I had touched the organ of consciousness and in some cases have them not wake up. Um, I can remember the first time the covering of the brain was peeled back to slow the, show the slowly pulsating, now rising, now falling surface of the brain uh, that I have come to believe, at least temporarily, is the seat of the soul. When the, when the brain is, is uh, when you're asleep under anesthesia, every time your body gets a breath, the brain rises and then falls again. So in addition to the pulsations with every heartbeat, it rises and falls with respirations from the ventilator. Many times during surgeries, I've been intensely aware that somewhere in that marvelous organ that lays before me dwells her consciousness, her person, her soul that I must strive to maintain at, at all costs. So 
Briefly, here's how we do surgery on the brain. Most of the time people are asleep, uh, though increasingly for tumors that we remove in very eloquent areas of the brain, like near the speech area or the movement area of the body, uh, we perform the resection of the tumors with people awake. Uh, so and I'll talk about that a little bit later. We put them to sleep uh, under anesthesia, but without a breathing tube, and then gradually wake them up when the brain is exposed. There's no pain sensation inside the brain. So you can open the skin, that's painful. The skull, there's no pain fiber, so you take the skull off with a drill, excuse me, and then open the covering of the brain, and no, the brain has no sensation. So you can touch the brain, operate on the brain, do anything, and no one feels anything. So um, this is a, a person that uh, I operated on with a, uh, a center of epilepsy. So this was some young man, I believe he was uh, 18, 19 at the time, that we operated to remove something that was causing epilepsy on the right side of his brain. And you can see where it lay uh, underneath the cerebral cortex here. Um, and uh, this is uh, kind of a little bit of his surgery. I hope you're not too, too squeamish, but you can see uh, some of this. Uh, this is the surface of the brain right here under a microscope. I operate under an operating <coughs> microscope and um, you know we're separating the surfaces of the brain. There's a little suction in my left hand and these little cotton patties we put here. These are tiny little scissors and again all these very important blood vessels but what we have to do is split one lobe of the brain from the other to get deep in there where this little piece of tissue is that's causing the seizures and, and, and cut it out. Um, so uh, again, it's under high magnification. This is a very important artery right here that if that were damaged, he'd lose function on the, on the opposite side of his body. It's a tiny little uh, knife that we're using to, again, separate the little, they call them gyri, the little folds of the, of the brain to, um, to expose the, uh, the tumor. Um, so this is um, what's called diffusion tensor imaging. So this is, uh, shows you some of the, um, the connections in the brain. There are seven to nine billion neurons in the brain and probably 100 times as many connections or synapses between nerves in the brain. So if you see this, this shows you all of the different fiber connections from one side of the brain to the other, front to back, side to side, etc. cetera. Um, so that is, uh, again, 80 to 90 billion neurons, not 8 to 9, but 80 to 90 and a thousand times more connections. The brain does everything. Okay? It makes you move. It makes you think. Uh, it makes you sense uh, the outside world. It's the seat of memories, uh, all of your perceptions. Uh, but you can't sense what's in the brain, right? So there's no sensation fibers inside the brain, no pain fibers. Uh, that's how we can do surgery on awake people. Death. How's that for a change of topic? <laughs> we know what death is. Death, philosophically, is the permanent cessation of all vital functions and the disintegration of the whole organism. So when someone dies or we declare him brain dead, and that is a sort of a hot topic right now, whether brain death even should be a, uh, a concept. Um, uh, but at death is when we say the soul has left the body. That is the, and the only way we can tell death absolutely permanently is disintegration of the body. But if we're animated by a soul, where does it live? Or is there a geographic location in the body where the soul lives? Where, and where does it go after death? So what is the evidence for the immortal soul? Is, is death it? Is our soul immortal? Does it live on after us? Or as some say, is the only way we live on through our accomplishments? Woody Allen was famous to quip, I don't, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work, I want to achieve it through not dying. It's like, it, he said, I don't want to live on in the hearts of my countrymen, I'd rather live on in my apartment in the west side. So the three Irishmen at the wake of Sean, Sean O'Callaghan, who's died, Mickey, Patty, and Liam. Mickey says to Patty and Liam, what, what do you want people to say about you when you, when you pass? Patty says, I'd like them to say Patty was a great father, a family man, a best man a family could ask for. Liam says, I'd like them to say, oh, Liam was a God-fearing man. He gave to the church and the poor, a saint of a man. And Mickey said, I'd like them to say, I'd like them to say, look, he's moving. He's <laughs> so, well, Dinesh D'Souza, um, you know, philosopher, author, media personality, intellectual, uh, former Catholic, uh, in his book, Life After Death, 
uh, talks about the belief in the after, afterlife, and it's really universal in religions all over the globe. The, the three Abrahamic religions, uh, Judaism, uh, Islam, and uh, Christianity, all believe in the immortality of the human soul. The body perishes, the soul lives on. Unless you're a Sadducee, right, Father? Is that to say? Uh, death, but death used to be a part of life. I mean, you guys probably don't experience it much, much anymore. People typically died at home. Uh, they didn't die in a hospital. Uh, it was a common sight in communities. Death, the funeral procession, you know, the, the uh, going down the street, the body on display. There was a good deal of conspicuous wailing and shrieking. The, you've heard of banshees in Ireland, you know, <laughs> screaming that were hired to, to come and, and, and wail. But people no longer die at home. You know, they die in a hospital. Uh, they die away from family away from view, cut off from the world around them. When's the last time somebody told you, you know, so-and-so died? No, it's, they passed. You know, they, they went on. They, you know, I saw an ad the other day or a, a, a ad for some veteran organization, and the woman said, he's gone to glory. You know, my, my husband's gone to glory. No, he's dead. He, he died. I mean, yes, maybe his soul has gone somewhere, but... Uh, uh, you know, we just don't have the, the, the hysterics, the no screaming, no, no sadness, really, uh, public, you know. So it's hard for, for you to see that. I told my wife, I said, when I die, I want people to hold my casket. You know, six guys have it. You know, you, you die now and you're put on a, on a little, you know, because of liability, they won't let you carry the casket. They put it on a little cart. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, just the, the you know, the organic nature of carrying a dead body. You know, this uh, materialism has a stranglehold on our, our society. So let's talk about the seed of the soul. By the end of the fifth century, uh, the question of whether the heart or the brain was the seat of the soul uh, remains unresolved in Western medicine. Um, this changed, however, with, I mean, even, even the sacred heart of Jesus, the immaculate heart of Mary. I mean, the heart's a muscle, if you excuse me. I mean, it's, it's, it's not the seat of compassion, intellect, etc. Now, granted, this is a, this is a, a symbol, you know, etc. But it should be the sacred brain of Jesus. I mean, it's... Uh, but by, by the end of the 5th century B.C., Hippocrates, okay, the great physician, we take a Hippocratic oath, said, men ought to know that from the brain, from the brain alone, arise our pleasures, joys, laughter, our sorrows, pain, griefs, and tears. Through it, in particular, we think we see, hear, and distinguish the ugly from the beautiful, the bad from the good, the pleasant from the unpleasant. I hold the brain is the most powerful organ of the human body. Wherefore, I assert the brain is the interpreter of consciousness. Socrates argues that bodies are mortal, made of perishable materials. The souls are not subject to these constraints. Um, that was in the 5th century BC. Plato thought of the soul as the essence of the person, an incorporeal and self-moving substance. The soul lived and gave life, animus, uh, and was immortal. Uh, like his teacher, Plato, Aristotle contended the soul was the essence of our being also, but he disagreed that the soul had a separate existence from the body and the person. Aquinas, according to Aquinas, the soul was the vital principle that enabled human beings to know and move and to love, and he contended the soul was distinct and derived directly from God of an immortal nature. Anybody know who did this? This sketch? This was, uh, sir? Leonardo. Leonardo, exactly. So, um, a number of philosophers thought the brain was the seat of the soul. Now, Leonardo da Vinci, from his dissections on cadavers, provided physical explanations of how the brain processes worked, visual input, and then speculated that the brain integrates the information via a soul. He placed the sight of the soul just above the optic chiasm in this area of the brain near the hypothalamus. Um, Descartes, I mentioned earlier, believed that the seat of the soul was the pineal gland, which is way, way back here, also deep in the brain. Um, he equated the mind and the soul together. Uh, Albrecht von Haller placed the soul in the medulla oblongata, which is probably a little closer to the truth, uh, the brain stem, where, where your consciousness comes from. And there was a German uh, neuroanatomist, Zomerang, who postulated it was in the ventricles. So. Um, the British neurophysiologist uh, Charles Sherrington was a Nobel Prize winner, pondered the location and functions of the mind, and he acknowledged that there were problems if you attempted to restrict the mind 
to the brain. Um, Australian neurophysiologist, Catholic, and also Nobel laureate uh, Sir John Eccles, although accepting of the principles of Darwinian evolution, nonetheless argued that there is a divine providence operating over and above the materialist happenings of biological evolution. Dr. Duncan McDougall will go on for history as the surgeon or the physician who first attempted to weigh the soul, okay? Now what is that? It's a crazy experiment. This guy from Massachusetts decided to weigh the soul by weighing a human being in the act of dying. So you can never do anything like this today, but he had six people that he knew were dying, brought them into his laboratory and uh, watched them die over a period of hours and had a scale. <laughs> so at the moment uh, the person died or took their last uh, gasp of air and the heart stopped, you know, he, he said in four of the six people, the scale went ding, uh, and, it, and it weigh, uh, the, the weight uh, changed, and the, the body became less by 0.5 to 1.5 ounces. So probably artifactual. <laughs> Nobody puts any credence in this now, but just showing you how, how this question has vexed man for, for a long time. So many say that near-death experiences could offer us some of that evidence that the immortal soul uh, does exist. NDEs, I'm going to call them near-death experiences, seem to have very similar composition. The ideal composite account, and many of you have heard heard this from people or read about it, the ideal account is the person is pronounced dead by a doctor, their heart stops, uh, and that they're reporting afterwards what happened. They, they hear loud noises, they move through a dark tunnel towards some sort of light, uh, they seem to see things from outside the body from some distance, they oftentimes encounter friends and spirits of relatives that they had known, dead people, some say they report seeing Jesus, God, they're dazzled by this bright life, they see a flashback of their whole life before them like the particular judgment. Uh, they approach a barrier and they want to go and then somebody says, nope, it's not your time. They turn back uh, and they can't express fully what happened to them to anybody. So that's the ideal sort of NDE. Thousands of descriptions of this um, in many people. Um, so famous people with NDEs. Plato didn't have one, but he wrote about it in the Republic. There was a soldier named Ur with an NDE. You probably read uh, Plato's Republic here, but when the, he, he says, when the bodies of those who died in the battle are collected, ten days after his death, Ur's body remained undecomposed. So he wasn't dead. He was probably asleep and in some sort of s s torpor or stupor. Uh, two days later, he revives on his funeral pyre and tells others of his journey in the afterlife, including an account of meeting other spirits, being in a tunnel, judging by divine beings, the idea that Moral people are rewarded and immortal people are, immoral people are punished after death and he, uh, he was told he would not be judged yet and returned to, uh, to life. Um, the Venerable Bede from, uh, from England or the, the British Isles at the time reported a similar case in his history of the English speaking people. Uh, this person that had died later recovered and became a, a Benedictine monk. Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> Wounded by shrapnel in World War I, lying in a hospital bed in Italy, he wrote to a friend that on that fateful night in 1918, a huge bomb exploded in the darkness. I died then. He said, I felt my soul or something coming right out of my body like you'd pull a handkerchief out of a pocket by one corner. Flew around, came back, went in again. I wasn't dead anymore. Hemingway said he was transformed by the experience and, and uh, some say a farewell to arms uh, came from that, uh, the genesis was from that event. Following a heart attack in 1944, Carl Jung, who was a, uh, a very famous psychologist, had a near-death experience when he felt himself come out of his body. He saw the earth from a vantage point about a thousand miles above it. Now, Mind you, in 1944, there were no rockets, no you know, satellites or photographs or anything. Here's how he described it. Seemed to me I was high up in space. Far below, I saw the globe of the Earth bathed in a gloriously blue light. I saw the deep blue sea of the continents far below me. Uh, my feet, I saw Ceylon. Ceylon is uh, Sri Lanka. 
Uh, my field of vision did not include the whole Earth. Its global shape was plainly distinguishable, and its outline shone with a silvery gleam through that wonderful blue light. I saw the reddish desert of Arabia. It was due as though the, sliver, the silver of the Earth had there assumed a reddish gold hue. Then came the Red Sea, and far, far back as in the upper left of a map, I could make out a bit of the Mediterranean. My gaze was directed chiefly towards that. I knew I was on the, part, the point of departing from Earth. Later I discovered how high in space one would have to be to see so extensive a view, approximately a thousand miles. The sight of the earth from this height was the most glorious thing I'd seen before. And when it was over, it took three weeks to pass before I could truly make up my mind uh, to live again. So, Carl Jung. Those with near-death experiences have provided perhaps the most convincing evidentiary arguments for the immortality of the human soul. They often provide description of things that they could never have known. People with NDEs have incredibly detailed accounts of what's happened while they were dead. They call them veridical experiences, uh, things that can be corroborated, <coughs> unusual or unique characteristics that are not part of ordinary resuscitation procedures. Many of these were described by a cardiologist from uh, the Netherlands called uh, Pim van Lummel. Von Lummel. So you can look up uh, the information. He's published a lot on this and actually embarked on a couple of studies uh, to study this in a, in a prospective basis. I'm going to relate 10 such events that uh, really some of these are, are, are astonishing. This is from a nurse. Uh, she was on the night shift. An ambulance brings in a 44-year-old comatose man into the coronary care unit. He'd been found about an hour before in a meadow by passersby. After admission, he gets a tube put in, um, and he um, gets artificial respiration, heart massage, defibrillation applied because his heart has, has stopped. Uh, uh, they want to intubate the patient. He has dentures. So intubate means put a tube down into his lungs to breathe for him. And they notice he's got dentures. So they take the dentures out, put them onto the crash cart. Uh, the nurse does this. Uh, meanwhile, they continue extensive CPR. After about an hour and a half, the patient gets a rhythm and a blood pressure back again. Uh, he's ventilated, intubated, he's still comatose, he's transferred to the ICU. So after about a week, he, he wakes up. Uh, and this nurse meets him, walks into his room, and uh, he says, I, I know, that nurse knows where my dentures are. <laughs> and uh, she says, what? And he goes, yes. You were the nurse that when I was brought into the hospital, you took the dentures out of my mouth and put them in that cart. It had all these bottles on it. There was a sliding drawer underneath, and you put my, uh, my teeth in there. The nurse said she was amazed because this happened while he was getting resuscitated, while he had no heartbeat, you know, presumably very little perfusion to his brain. And at the time he had observed the situation, he'd been, he'd been afraid that people would stop the CPR and he would die. And he mentions, mentions thinking, I need to tell people I'm really still alive. But he, you know, he, he knew that the people in the room and the nurse corroborates that we were all pretty negative that he was going to make it. You know, most people don't make it when you do this. Out of you know, the number of people that get CPR, very few actually are revived. So he tells her that he desperately and unsuccessfully tried to make it clear that he was alive and we should continue the CPR. He was deeply impressed by this experience and said he was no longer afraid of death. Four weeks later, he left as a healthy man. Um, case number two, an elderly woman who suffered a cardiac arrest during her stay in the hospital, where I, the person writing this, was the chairman of the psych department. She was unconscious when they began resuscitation. And according to her later report, she floated out of her body, near the win stood near the window watching the resuscitation. During the resuscitation, a pen fell out of her doctor's pocket and rolled near the same window where her out-of-body spirit was standing and watching. The doctor walks over, picks up the pen, put it back in his pocket, and then joined the frantic effort to save her, you know, CPR. Um, no, he soothingly reassured her. So, so a, a few days later, uh, she told her doctor that she observed the resuscitation team doing you know, CPR on her, and the doctor says, no, no, you're probably hallucinating because of the anoxia, anoxia, the lack of oxygen to the brain. This can happen sometimes when the heart stops beating. And he, she said, no, but I saw your pen roll over to the window. And then she described the pen and the other details of the resuscitation. The doctor was shocked. Uh, his patient had not only been comatose during the resuscitation, but she had been blind for many years. 
uh, cardiologist was still shaken days later when he told me about it. He confirmed that everything the woman related had indeed taken place and his descriptions, her descriptions were very accurate. Blind people actually curiously in the NDEs see a majority of the time. People who have no vision. Elizabeth uh, uh, Kubler-Ross, uh, who wrote a famous book on death and dying, gave detailed descriptions of people who <clears throat> described their medical procedures, identified jewelry on people that were working on them, etc. And this Professor von Lemmel from uh, the Netherlands has hundreds of cases just like this. 80% of people born blind see in their near-death experiences. Another case, number three. A surgery patient under anesthesia, draped above the neck, <laughs> subsequently described, described leaving his body and watching the cardiac surgeon flapping his arms at, as if to fly. The surgeon verified this description of his movements, saying in an effort to prevent contamination after scrubbing in, he directed his staff in this way. Uh, a medical colleague of the surgeon's was exasperated. So explain that to me. Explain that through chemicals or some other scientific expl explanation. How does the man who was uh, unconscious know that. Th this one is pretty cool, number four. A Seattle woman who had an NDE after a myocardial infarction, her heart stopped, uh, was taken to an ER at night, given CPR because her heart had stopped, and after about an hour was resuscitated. She told the social worker a few days later after she woke up that she saw her body floating, that she floated outside of her body, saw it there, floated above the, the hospital, and saw a shoe on the roof of the hospital, a tennis shoe with a worn patch and a lace stuck under the heel. Social worker thought, well, that's ridiculous. This lady was brought to the ER at 10 o'clock at night. She couldn't see anything. So a few days later, the social worker climbed out on a ledge through the window, and only after climbing out onto the roof and going around a couple nooks and crannies, found the shoe exactly described as this woman did. Uh, this is case number five. This is a six-year-old girl drew a picture of her resuscitation. Six-year-olds don't know what, what a hospital resuscitation looks like. I mean, this is really amazing. So you see people floating, angels, you see somebody getting CPR on the table. Um, people described encounters with dead people, with people who were deceased. Um, this is uh, Professor von Lemmel himself telling you about uh, one such case. So we'll see if the audio works here. And that if deceased acquaintances or relatives are encountered and see in another worldly dimension, they are usually recognized by the appearance. And communication is possible through thought transfer. Quote. During my cardiac arrest, I had an extensive experience. And later I saw, apart from my deceased grandmother, a man at me lovingly, but whom I did not know. More than ten years later, at my mother's deathbed, she confessed to me that I'd been born out of an extramarital relationship, my father being a Jewish man who had been deported and killed during the Second World War. And my mother showed me his picture. The unknown man that I had seen more than ten years before, during my NDE, turned out to be my biological father. So they meet relatives, deceased relatives, people that they believe they should have known. Case number seven, an NDE survivor named Sandra, who con conducted or contracted encephalitis, that's a disease of the brain, a, a horrible infection, and lost consciousness, uh, eventually uh, arrested and was recovered and uh, drew a sketch of a girl she met during her coma. When she told her parents what she was drawing, they became ashen and left the room. Later, they returned and told her about the sister she knew she, she never knew she had, who was struck by a car and died before she had been born. Uh, case number eight, an adult whose NDE occurred in childhood reported that while he was in the light, he became aware that there were some presences there, some ladies. Uh, he didn't know them. He said they were so loving, wonderful, I didn't want to come back. Uh, I didn't see any pictures of them until I was adult, but I said, Oh yeah, they were my great-grandmothers who died before I was born, when he was shown these pictures by his, his parents. Many people experience a life review, sort of like the particular judgment, that uh, a review of one's life events. Case number nine is a man in a near-death experience uh, who was in a car accident, described all the features of the accident. Uh, he had the feeling, he said, of moving through a dark tunnel, um, up towards a point of light, suddenly a being filled with love and light appeared to him. 
and now he had a second life review, one guided by the being of light. He felt bathed in love and compassion as he reviewed the moral choices he had made in his lifetime. In case number 10, uh, circulatory arrest. This was a, um, a procedure that we used to do in neurosurgery we don't do anymore, where we uh, take people and uh, drain the blood out of them, put them on a bypass machine, cool the body down to about 18 degrees Celsius, so 60 some degrees. I mean, it's, uh, and you're basically in suspended animation. Think of it as someone falling into a frozen lake and their heart stops and they've been resuscitated in some of these cases after an hour or two. And we would do this. This was a woman with a giant aneurysm in her brain. Uh, the procedure was done to her uh, at a place in Phoenix and she was in, in suspended animation, circulatory arrest, no blood circulating to her brain or the rest of her body. And she was able to very uh, describe everything that happened to her in the operating room after the fact. This has been published uh, as well. The, what the surgeons were playing on the radio, uh, in, in the, on the uh, digital uh, machine in the, in the operating room. What the, the bipolar forceps that we used to control bleeding, she said it was, a, it was a D. She was a musician. She said, perfect pitch. She said it was a D. I heard that. Uh, just uh, really unbelievable. Anesthesia, anesthesiologists uh, say that, well, it could have been, you know, recall from anesthesia. It could have been the the, um, uh, the medicines you were on, but uh, uh, many physicians, uh, you know, 59% of doctors actually believe in, in life after death, much higher than what is found in, in almost any, any other profession. Um, materialists and science, scientism will say that your joys, your sorrows, your memories, your ambition, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nurse, nerve cells and their associated molecules. This is Francis Crick who uh, discovered the helical nature of, uh, of DNA. He published that. Um, but Dinesh D'Souza uh, claims that our minds simply cannot be accounted for in terms of our neurons and I would, I would uh, espouse that same belief. Several prominent neuroanatomists, neuroscientists, among others, believe in the concept of dualism, that there is, you know, the view that in humans inhabit two separate and distinct realms. Uh, Cartesian dualism is what it's been called. We are our minds, in other words, but our, uh, we possess bodies. And you've maybe heard the C.S. Lewis quote, which is not accurate. He actually never said this, but you don't have a soul, you are a soul you have a body. So he really didn't say this, and that borders on Gnostic heresy, but um, there are dualists who, who believe that you know, we, we, we in, es in essence, are separate entities. There was a neurosurgeon named Wilder Penfield, uh, who is somebody that I greatly respect, who died a couple of decades ago, who was a dualist. And he operated well over, well over a thousand patients. And what he would do is stimulate the brain. I mentioned we do awake brain surgery. And he stimulated thousands of patients and operated on them in the awake setting. And he found that long imprinted memories were there. Um, he described, uh, here he is uh, now, um, describing what he did for a living and talking to one of the patients. This was from a Bell Lab uh, video done uh, many years ago. The operation carried out by the local anesthetist was the patient is conscious and can talk. He does not see that as a So he says the operations are under local anesthesia. These are his operations. It is as though the electrode touched a wire recorder or a, or a strip of film and he relives a period of time. So when he stimulates the brain, he relives a period of time, a memory of some sort. And people say that these memories are not just, you know, ephemeral. These are real, much more real, as if the song is playing right in front of them. So here's another uh, video of the same surgeon talking to a woman that he had operated on. You had a tingling in your thumb. probably forgot. There underneath it. To my you said, I hear music. I hear music. Then I repeated it without warning you a little while ago. You said, I hear that music again. Tell us what you heard. Well, I heard what sounded like an orchestra playing. And I asked the nurse where it was coming from. And she asked me the name of it. But I, I said, I know the song, but I can't think of the name of it. And then I stimulated it again, you remember, and asked you about it. You were humming. Did you hum it now or you remember? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, and then when you got that point, 
next thing I know what it is, it's rolling along together. You said what? Yes, that's what it is. So, so this happens. People, we stimulate the brain, and he would, um, he would stimulate the brain. Um, he would stimulate the brain and hear these things, and then go to a different part of the brain, and then go back to it unexpectedly, and she would hear it again. The same, the same song. Um, just like he said, stimulating a tape recorder. So, he didn't believe that the substance of the brain accounted for everything that was the mind, and that's why he was, he was a dualist. He quoted three different, uh, posited three different lines of evidence. Number one, the stimulations were concrete things. At no point did he stimulate and there was an abstract thought, like, you know, somebody said, ah, oh, that's beautiful, or something. It was, they would see something, or hear something, or remember a person talking to them. Um, that there were no intellectual seizures, so seizures where a, a fit happens, someone moves one side of the body. There was, there were no intellectual seizures in all of his experience. And when asking them to move their arm, they always retained a correct sense of agency. In other words, they knew that he was moving their arm, they weren't moving their arm. It, it was coming from outside the brain. And here's a, here's a similar thing that, uh, that we had happen. So here's a patient uh, here, under the drapes. Uh, she is awake. Uh, you can see a photo of her right there. We're watching the, the big screen in the operating room. Um, and then we went ahead and stimulated her brain uh, and we, would, we put things on top of the brain like this when we're doing epilepsy surgery so we can monitor electrical activity under those electrodes and then go back and cut out the, uh, the epilepsy, the epileptiform um, area. Here is uh, exactly what Penfield described, a young man that uh, I was operating on and I was around the area of his face trying to, to know I didn't want to take out a tumor and paralyze his hand or his face, so I'm having stick his tongue out, and you see the tongue move suddenly to one side, and uh, I'm thinking, is he doing that? I said, stick your tongue out, and then it would go to the other side as soon as I stimulated that area, and you hear me? I said, yeah. said you're not doing that, right? I'm, I'm doing that? And he goes, yeah, you're doing that. I, I'm, not, I'm not moving my tongue. So, but, uh, yeah. So how does the mind act on the body? You know, dualism has a problem. Is there a physical link between the two? So D'Souza says the mind is like a ghost, okay? Uh, the body is like a wall. How can a ghost move a wall you know, when nature of ghosts is really to go through, through things like the wall? So how do you study an immaterial thing like the soul? Uh, the soul is, is not material. It's not objective. Um, so while deterioration of the brain might impede the operation of the mind, if the two are separate, it makes it possible that our own material minds and consciousness might survive the, the termination of our physical frames. D'Souza posits, if your mind is independent enough to create changes in your body and your brain, it seems reasonable enough to suppose it can survive the dissolution of your body and your brain. And he, he, he mentions two features of human nature, consciousness and free will that are irreducible to matter, right? Those are the mind and the, and the soul. With no natural explanation, uh, they are irreducible to matter. And it's certainly possible to believe our immortal souls are, in essence, our likeness to God. So finally, come back to the question, is the brain really the seat of the soul? Well, we started out with Michelangelo, who early on, as you may remember, posited the heart as the seat of the soul. Well, it seems he seemed to have given some thought to this as well, because he was known to be an expert in human anatomy from his cadaveric uh, dissections, and he is found to have concealed a very accurate picture of the human brain in the Sistine Chapel in the Cape of, uh, in the Cape of God in the famous creation of Adam fresco in the Sistine Chapel. So you can see here the comparison of the mid-sagittal section of the brain and the fresco uh, in the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, which is called the creation of Adam. And people say, well, God is giving life to Adam, but their fingers are not touching, okay? And his eyes are open. He's still alive. Could this be God giving Adam will or intellect, uh, wisdom? Um, I leave you with this hypothesis. The human brain is the supreme pinnacle of God's creation, at least temporarily subsumes the locus of the soul. And as such, we must care for the substance, the body and the brain, as well as the soul. Thank you.
So this was uh, just a quote, uh, quote from Augustine, take care of your body as if you're going to live forever and take care of your soul as if you were to die tomorrow. All right, any questions? Yeah. Uh, doctor has been uh, uh, graciously offered to field questions, so if anyone has questions, let's, let's hear them. I, I've, got, I've got a few, I'm ready to go. Sure. John. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, first and foremost, that was super. You're welcome. Um, regarding the near body or near death experiences, I can think of like a skeptic, there's a ham line going, oh, the brain is just this amazing thing that has all these untapped potential that we don't know about. It's not actually the soul. It's just a material thing, but we don't understand how it works yet. Is there, what, what would you say to somebody? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so true. When I went into neurosurgery 30 plus years ago, I did it because the brain was a vast frontier. We didn't understand anything. I mean, the heart's a muscle. Kidneys a filter. I mean, <laughs> used to joke about these things among medical students together. But um, and and thirty some years later, we still the brain is huge, vast frontier. We don't know much about it. We don't know how how if anything the soul or consciousness arises. You know, in the brain. Uh, John Eccles, this uh, Nobel Prize winner and a, a Catholic from Australia, had. Um, had thoughts about how consciousness could arise uh, by the firing of neurons in certain parts of the brain. Um, I don't know, the near-death experiences, some of them are pretty convincing. You know, how you could account for the sight of these people seeing things that no one could have seen when they were dead with no blood flow to their brain. You know, to think that this was just something that was conjured up. It's, you read this book uh, by D'Souza and others uh, and study Professor Von Lemmel and all of his things. He, he's actually doing a, I was mentioning this to Mr. Kerr, a, a prospective study on near-death experiences. He's gone into hospitals all throughout the EU and put things up in the, the rafters of rooms and the high places in rooms because always the souls seem to float above the, the, the bodies. And he's doing it in critical care units where people die where they arrest, and in ER bays. And he's putting these things up there in hopes that at some point they're going to find somebody who, you know, who dies and then comes back, was in that room, and can verify that they saw things that nobody else could see uh, that were in the room. I don't know how the studies go on, but I know they haven't recruited a lot of patients yet because, as I mentioned, most people who arrest don't, don't make it. So uh, I think near-death experiences are pretty convincing evidence of, the, of the, um, the, the fact that there is an immortal soul. Now, whether the brain is the locus, uh, I mean, I, that's obviously up to, up to uh, speculation, yes. So uh, it, it seems like many of the stories of the NDEs <coughs> follow a, a similar pattern. Um, and most that I hear about are, uh, the, the experience is generally pleasant. And, and is, uh, for those who come back, well, it, it, they, they're reassured. Mm -hmm. Are there instances, I mean, it, it would seem like there could be some instances where maybe it might not be a pleasant experience. Is that? Is yeah, that's a really good point. That? Uh, what, do we, what do we make of that? That is a really good point, and I seem to recall hearing of similar things in people who changed their lives. I mean, uh, the, the uh, Plato's uh, uh, Plato's soldier that he that he wrote about who came back mentioned that there was they knew that there was a place where souls who were immoral moral went and, uh, and but people do come back and they've seen a sort of a review of their particular judgment and change you know change things but you know that's a good point I mean you don't you don't hear a whole lot of these where people went and saw you know people I mean, I mean, you do have visions from saints and, right. and others who describe purgatory. In Rome, there's a purgatory museum at uh, a church uh, uh, not too far from the Vatican. So, um, yeah, that is a good point. Uh, there, there, but, but I know there are some out there, some I mean, negative it, experiences. Is it possible that they, they've not uh, undergone the judgment? I mean, Father? I mean, there are yeah. some. There's a, there's a priest, I don't recall the name right now, but who a couple years ago gave a talk about he was in a car accident and what he reported was in the car accident he was brought before the Lord and told he was going to hell and that Our Lady uh, interceded for him and he went back to his body so those 
those uh, testimonies are out there. I've never studied the cases, but that's what I heard directly him witnessing to, and he needed to really mm -hmm. get it act together afterwards. So wow. I would maybe they're not eager to publish those, but those yeah. There's a book, Imagine Heaven. I think it's called Imagine Heaven, and the author has about a thousand stories that they've compiled. Not all of them are good. I, when a patient tells me I died, that's always their. Uh, you can ask me if you want, but I'm not going to say anything else because I don't think you believe me. I always ask. And I've had a couple that were not good experiences. I changed my ways. You know, or I don't want to talk about it. I've had a couple like that. But most of the time they are good. But that book, Imagine, had it. by a Protestant. So he tries to put a lot of doctrine and reinvent the will. Mm -hmm. If I got the stories of God, he uh, Eben Alexander is a acquaintance of mine, a neurosurgeon, who a number, about four or five years ago wrote a book on the name of it, but a similar deal. And he, but he wasn't brain dead. He was. He had a bad meningitis. Was in a coma for a number of number of weeks, and eventually came out of it. And describes a lot of the same thing. He was a pretty agnostic uh, before this, and is now a believing Christian. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, no, I know. It's it's, but it's really not. And we we prepare prepare people for it by telling them about it before surgery. We explain the experience. We actually put them asleep uh, to open the skin and the skull because you know if you use a jigsaw to take the skull off, it sounds kind of disconcerting. Although it's not painful, it's not painful at all. But the reason is if we're taking a tumor out. So when you look at like when you saw the brain there, I can't say you can't look at it and say. You know, there's nothing that says, this is speech, this is right hand, this is left hand, you know. But we, we have a general idea of where those things are, but they're not, it's not 100%. And you don't want to go in and try and take a tumor out that looks awfully like the normal brain and have somebody wake up, you know, like this. And so if it's, so what we do know is we do an awake surgery when it's close to an area like that so that we can know if we're getting near it. We'll take a little stimulator and like, like that guy was doing, you know, touch the face and and go like that and go, okay, I don't want to go there. I got to stay away from there. Even if the tumor goes into that area, we're not going to do it because we don't want them to wake up paralyzed. So it, it's not the majority of cases that we do, but we do uh, I don't know, half a dozen a, a month and then at KU. Just the whole thing. Do, the, do the spots in the brain move as the person is, is stimulating them, or is it just when you stimulate them that the person <clears throat> So obviously, if you laid a, like a grid, like some of those grids I showed on the surface of the brain, over the area that moved the hand. When they move their hand, you would see it, you know, you'd see a bunch of electrical activity there. So, yeah, there's a tonic level of electrical activity that's going on all the time. We just stimulate it to, to make it easier for us to see and identify. Sometimes we'll not stimulate. We'll just have them awake talking. Like if it's in the speech area of the brain, we will stimulate, uh, we'll have them, you know, say a prayer. Say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be there. When you start stimulating, they literally quit, quit talking. Or we'll say, uh, you know, what is this? Oh, that's a phone. What is this? Hmm. And when we're stimulating, they can't figure it out because that's the memory, the word recognition part of the brain. So uh, we'll oftentimes just have them talk to a neuropsychologist for, for an hour under the drapes while we're taking the tumor out. And every once in a while they'll say, hey, there, he's slurring his speech a little bit or he's, he's not remembering or he's making errors, paraphasic errors. Like uh, instead of, you know, microphone, they'll say meal or, you know, manic or they'll, they'll get the consonant right but not the word. So things like that. So the speech therapist or the neuropsychologist will be under the drape saying, hey, you're getting close to something because they're, they're, they're having errors. How, how long... You should, at the beginning, you had that uh, video you were taking out. Yeah, uh, a little. An mm -hmm. epileptic. Tissue. Yeah, focus, yeah. How long of the surgery was that? Uh, about four, four and a half hours, maybe five hours. It takes about 30, 45 minutes to actually get to the surface of the brain. So we numb up the skin, open the skin, take the bone off, open the covering of the brain. And then maybe a couple of hours to get down to it, cut the thing out, and then 45 minutes to close up. What's some of the longest surgeries you've done? When I was young and inexperienced, I did a 24-hour, 27-hour, 26-hour procedure on a arteriovenous malformation of the brain, which is a really complex uh, uh, structure in the brain or uh, 
you know, pathology where there's a lot of bleeding and you have to stop the bleeding. And so I, uh, I had a partner in there with me and uh, yeah, we went, went a long time. David? Yeah. Uh, you said you had a colleague who thought the soul lived in, with kidney or liver or something like that. What's, what's his justification for that? I had a what? Sorry. A colleague who said he thought the, the soul lived with oh, yeah. kidney or uh, he, was, he was joking. Yeah. He, was, <laughs> so, yeah. he would get up in front of us and say, the seat of the soul is the kidney. I said, Seriously? Come on. A, yes. Are there any so there's parts of the brain that are directly connected to the <clears throat> Yeah, so that's that. That was sort of Penfield's, you know, argument for uh, the soul or the the the. You know, he never could stimulate an area that uh, would will, you know, will someone to do something. You know, it was always a concrete experience. Now, it could be that it was too deep in the brain, like way down in the brainstem area. The the uh, so there's the the hippocampus is the area that subsumes our, our short-term memory. It's called hippocampus, which is, uh, what is hippo in Greek? Who knows Greek here? <clears throat> horse? 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 Okay, a hippo's a horse, right? Uh, Philip is a uh, lover of horses, Philippos. The hippodrome. So hippocampus, seahorse. So it looks like a seahorse. And that's where the memory is deep down in the brain. So, yeah, it could be that maybe the soul lives down in, in that part of the brain. When you, when you remove someone's hippocampus bilaterally or they have a, uh, there's a, there's a uh, disease called uh, transient global amnesia where people will literally all of a sudden wake up and not know who they are, where they are, keep asking the same question over and over again. It's usually, it's probably an ischemic insult. It usually gets better and goes away and never happens again, but it's, it's the strangest thing you've ever seen. Somebody's like, where am I? Well, honey, you're, you're here at home. You just had breakfast. Oh, okay. And take a few bites and say, where am I? What am I doing? I mean, just the same thing. Oh, they cannot form short-term memories. And that, that's way deep in the brain in the hippocampus. Yes, sir. So do you believe that the soul resides in the brain? Because I thought that um, the soul was like permeated the whole body and didn't... Yeah, that's a really good point, yeah. To a specific locus, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could say, so there was a woman who died, what is her name, Jaya, Jaya I can't remember. So there's a philosopher, theologian named Nicanor Austriaco, who's a Dominican priest at uh, Providence, I believe, who who is one of the people who postulates that, you know, brain death really isn't death. So death is the disintegration of the organism. And as a case, he presents this woman, <clears throat> young woman who had a bad insult to the brain, ischemia, not enough blood to the brain, and the brain dies. Like, dead brain, there's no activity. Pupils don't react, uh, you know, there's no movement, there's no brainstem reflexes, dead, dead person. And those people donate organs now. That's, that's where everybody gets a heart transplant or kidney transplant from live, live people. Well, he says, wait a minute, death is disintegration. This woman lived 10 years with a dead brain, with a brain that they did an autopsy when she finally did die. Her brain was like this big. I mean, it completely shrunken away. And yet, you would go into her room, her skin was normal, her face looked normal, you know, she, was, she wasn't breathing, the machine was breathing for her, but you know, <clears throat> the body was not disintegrated. So probably not death is the soul, but the brain certainly didn't have the soul in this lady. It was probably permeated the, you know, the whole body. So that, that is a good point. Um, and you know, that's a big controversy in the, in the church today. Under John Paul II, they, uh, they, they had a, you know, a number of philosophers, theologians get together and they said, okay, the concept of brain death, we think it's, it's legit. Um, the brain has to be irreversibly injured and the cessation of all function from the brain. In other words, if it weren't for the ventilator, this person would be disintegrated. They wouldn't be breathing, their heart would have stopped the whole nine yards and within a few hours they'd have rigor mortis. Uh, but uh, because the ventilator's breathing for them, their body looks normal. So the question is, is that death? The, the brain no longer functions? Is it not death because we're keeping the body alive artificially? But I mean, if that went away, there's no organ transplants. So it's a, it's a tough problem. Uh, when you're cutting through the brain, like you cut, cut through the squishy part, 
it it's all back. squishy. <laughs> yeah. How do you put it back together? Yeah, so we, we try to do things like if it's an aneurysm of the brain, those usually live down at the bottom and you have to kind of split the brain apart, try not to damage it, go way down there, put a tiny little clip on the thing so it doesn't bleed again. Tumors we just, you know, cut out. So we're, there's a hunk of brain. When we're done with a tumor case, you see a hole, a hole in the brain where the, where the tumor lived. And usually the tumor pushes the brain kind of out of the way. And so after you remove it, sometimes the brain comes back. Um, but, but then we, the brain is in a sack called the dura mater. Anybody here a Latin scholar? Dura mater. What does that mean? <laughs> tough, tough mother. Yeah, tough mother. <laughs> tough mother. So it's a sack that holds the brain called the tough mother, the dura mater. <laughs> we open that to get to the brain, and then we close it again afterwards, close the sack over top of it. And then we plate the bone back in place with some little rivets and screws. Bzz, 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 so put it back. When we were doing the, showing the picture of the epileptic thing, yes. is that a different color? And are those things normally different colors? So no. So what I had done was <clears throat> we have these little things that are kind of like GPS system for the brain. On the, uh, on the MRI, you can see a slight difference from the surrounding brain. But in real life, I didn't show it, but further on in the video, it looks just like normal brain. So on the MRI, I can highlight it, make it a different color, and then it beams it into the microscope that I'm using. So you can actually, I don't know if I still, I might, might even uh, be able to show you later on in the video, it's overlaid the brain. So we can actually uh, see, um, uh, it's not showing here, let's do this, okay. So you can actually see the, um, no, anyway, I can't, uh, I can't show it, but it, it overlays it like a, like a, you know, one of the, uh, you know, missile things that you see soldiers fighting with their heads up display and they, the target shows up here. In my microscope, I see the target, and so I can get down there and say, well, it looks like normal brain. No, nope, it's the epilepsy. Cut it out, so. If any of these young men here are considering uh, the medical profession as uh, you know, part of their vocation. Do you have any uh, anything to share with them as far as yeah, that it's discernment, the, the current climate, etc. Anything. Well, like I said at the beginning, I mean, it's a corporate work of mercy. You know, you take care of sick people. You you have to have a passion passion for that. Uh, you can. There are so many different fields in medicine that you can go into. You can take care of people like Penelope with cancer. You can uh, be a surgeon and work with your hands. You can work in the eyes. You can be a neurologist and study the brain. Well, you can't really do anything, but you can, you can give some medicine. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you have to have a passion for it it's, and, it's, and be dedicated to it. But it's a very, very rewarding profession. I, I would say that it's going to become more and more difficult for your generation, however, to practice medicine in a moral uh, manner. I mean, we are constantly, uh, Penelope can tell you this from personal experience, berated and persecuted by the, the, uh, you know, the powers that be, uh, waiting, you know, if you poke your head up too high to get uh, deplatformed and, and uh, but, you know, there, there's hope. Uh, Benedictine is uh, starting a Catholic, uh, what we hope will be an authentically Catholic medical school uh, in, uh, in several years. And I say authentically Catholic because of the four Catholic medical schools in this country, pretty sure most of them do abortions at their, at their hospital. They're all Jesuit schools. Uh, I'm not sure about Creighton, but I know Loyola, Georgetown, and SLU uh, uh, all do. So uh, it's, it's really going to be tough to, to uh, practice in an ethical, uh, ethical manner and not be uh, you know, restricted. But we need, we need people you know, to, to continue that for sure. And anybody wants to ever shadow you know, when you're home for the summer or whatever, uh, let me know. You can come into the OR as long as I think the rules are you have to be 16 or something. Now if you want to witness surgery or... Come talk to me sometime. Happy to. Doctor, if we do shadow, what, if you 
mentioned listening to the radio while doing surgery. What type of music do you listen to? So I listen to Frank Sinatra, uh, Mel Torme, Dean Martin, sort of old crooners. Um, yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 <laughs> In fact, when I when I go into the to the operating room, my residents are often doing the sort of the skin opening of the procedures, and I'll I'll come in while they're and they're listening to some just you know trash, you know, bada, 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 you know, and I'll walk in the room and you know everybody loves somebody something. They they, they know to change the music so that uh, as soon as I walk in. Are you uh, are you able to share any stories from your? Uh, Related to football, um, no. probably not personal yeah. stories, but I've okay. I've taken care of a lot of. Uh, yeah. I'm an unofficial or what an unaffiliated neurotrauma consultant for the NFL, so I'm yeah. on the sideline at all the Chiefs games. And uh, a few years ago, the NFL um, required every um, every professional uh, football team to have two neurosurgeons, now three, at uh, at every game. So one on each sideline. And um, we have to be unaffiliated just because, even though <clears throat> we manage Arrowhead, but you know, if Peyton Manning is down and I say, oh yeah, you're concussed, you gotta go out, <laughs> you can't be a homer, you know. So I stand on the, I oftentimes stand on the chief sidelines, and when the Chiefs score a touchdown, I'm standing next to the team doctor, you know, who'll go like, hey, high five. I, go, I can't do anything, sorry. It's, it's, you know, so, um, so yeah, we take care of, uh, so, you know, kudos to the NFL for. Uh, coming to this uh, realization a number of years ago that they have not managed concussion well through the years and um, you know guys would you talk to anybody who played the game um, years ago and they'll tell you you know oh we were I don't remember the second half of the game I played the whole game you know they give you smelling salts and get out there get, get, get keep going and so and the team doctors really don't have the uh, the players best well, Often it, it was accused that they don't have the players' best interest at heart, and so the PA, the NFL Players Association, was what got this going and said, "Look, we want independent doctors on the sideline to examine anybody who has any question of concussion, and uh, and then uh, you know they they have to uh, um, they have to pass muster before the team doc doesn't make the call." So suffice it to say, there've been a couple of instances where you know. If the Chiefs hadn't won the playoff game, I was going in the witness protection program, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, and you know, I know you guys play, you know, rugby, and that's uh, that's tough. But you know, it's a different it's a different game, obviously, and th there don't seem to be as many, certainly not high profile, but as many professional rugby players that have these kind of incidents. For I guess the, the way the game is played, and the fact that. Uh, you know, there's no helmets or pads or anything. I mean, these guys think they're, you know, invincible. That 370-pound uh, guy running a 4440, you know, at another guy that's the same size, and they got a helmet, and you know, they can. But uh, no matter how how safe they try and make the game by, you know, upping the helmet technology, etc., there's still going to be, you know, this uh, this uh, terrible uh, side effect. Uh. Sir. Do you have time for sure, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Matt, um, can you speak a little bit about, uh, <clears throat> more about concussions? And is there, like, for people who have a number of concussions? Uh, uh oh. <laughs> Personal story. Yeah, so. so yeah, so has anybody seen the movie Concussion? The years ago came out with, yeah. So that, that um, and the, the, the concussion that the protagonist in that was a Catholic uh, pathologist from Pittsburgh, Ben Amalu. But um, so a lot of that was sensationalized. They took a lot of artistic license. You know, you hear about people in the NFL. What is it, Junior Seau, who yeah. shot himself? You know, oh, it was because he was concussed so many times. Well, look back over his history. Before he got into football, he was a you know alternative kind of guy and you know the people the, the the guy who was the uh, case zero in Pittsburgh the center I can't remember his name yeah he he had uh, I mean he, his father committed suicide he had relatives with bipolar disorder he had bipolar disorder he was addicted to narcotics you know all kinds of other things than concussions so but that being said um, we don't know a lot about concussions I mean you can take an MRI of somebody who's just been concussed looks completely normal 
but they can't remember what they had for breakfast and their head hurts and their eyes are, are hurting and, and all of that. But the MRI is normal. So we know, you know there's something wrong. The neurons have been torqued by a rotation of the brain. We do know that multiple concussions is, is bad. You know, so if you've had three, four, you might think about not getting any more head injuries. And if you have another one before you've recovered from one, that's the other bad thing. In the NFL, we have, they have a five-day return to play protocol. So you're out uh, the next day. You, ha you cannot do anything unless you are without symptoms. So you can't even go to a team meeting. You know, if you still have a headache, sorry, you're out. But if the next day you're fine, you can come to the team meeting. The next day, you maybe do a little aerobics. The next day, you do some light uh, you know, exercise with uh, resistance. The next day, you put on pads and go out and run on the field. The next day, you do you know, contact. And if all through that, you have 24 hours each, each uh, um, uh, part, and you have no symptoms, then you can play. So it's pretty unlikely somebody pulled for a concussion on Sunday is going to play the next Sunday. It does happen, but it's, it's pretty unlikely. Um, so I would say, you know, we don't know a lot about it, but we do know that returning to play and getting another concussion before you've completely healed from the previous one is, is not good. Yes? Yeah, I was, I was going to ask, um, do you know why most of the time when people get major uh, concussions, it's uh, memory loss that's normally a big thing, or sometimes if you're eyesight? Why is it those two? Yeah, that's a good... When, when you leave your head, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, probably because, I mean, this is my own theory, that so much of the brain uh, deals with those processes. Like uh, uh, vision, okay, there's a lot of your brain that deals with vision. The front part of your brain causes you to look to a certain direction and pay attention. This part of your brain uh, makes you... Uh, neglect or not neglect one side of your space. This part of your brain is the actual vision that comes in to your eyes. The brain stem and the cerebellum in the back of your head is the coordination of your vision. So um, then there's nerves that, that make your eyes go this way, that way. So there's so much of the brain deals with vision. And it's the same thing with memory. A lot of this portion of the brain, the brain that makes us human, you know, animals don't have this, the, the cerebral cortex like we do. So much of that is de is deals with uh, executive functioning, thinking, planning, um, certain memories. And then the other thing is that deep in the brain, where we think concussions probably affect most, is where the memory structures live. The hippocampus, the uh, uh, you know, consciousness, all of that is really deep in the brain. So the concussion, you'll see diagrams and videos where they think the brain kind of turns inside the skull and rotates, and that torque affects those deep parts of the brain more than more than other parts. You could get, you know, if you actually got a fracture over the side of your head, like, like if you would imagine, there's something called the homunculus. If you look at a brain anatomy, um, and that is, uh, if you lay a person on the top of the brain with the feet and legs here, and the mouth and head over here. Like imagine a person laying like that. So the mouth and head are over here, the arms are here, the knees and hips are here, and down in the center is the feet. So that if you get a you know a puncture wound or depressed fracture over those parts of the brain, you can have you know problems with the arm or leg. But most of the time, it's memory and vision, like you say. Yeah. Headaches. Yes, sir. What is that? Is the brain made of? Neurons. Yeah, eighty to ninety billion neurons, and then neurons are nerve cells. They're cells that uh, you know send out an electrical impulse really that communicate with other neurons via something called synapses so they send out a little process and and they the electric uh, the uh, axon of the neurons the the little uh, cable uh, that runs the electricity it goes down that cable and then to the end and either conducts via electricity or more likely via a chemical that's released at the connection that communicates with the one next to it. And then there's a whole bunch of supportive cells as well that uh, have functions like they regulate uh, chemicals in the brain and oxygen and things like that. And then there's some blood vessels that obviously supply oxygen to the brain and take, take waste out of the brain. So most of the brain is neurons and supporting cells. Sir. That's a good question. And there is a guy who actually has done that in monkeys. It's kind of spooky. There's some videos on YouTube. Um, 
of a guy that took uh, brain out of one monkey. So here's the problem is you have to, to move the brain, you got to cut the brain off of the spinal cord. So everything up here communicates with your arms and legs for sensation and for movement. But to take a brain from here and put it here, you got to cut it right there. So how are you going to reconnect you know, billions of neurons in the spinal cord? So, but the spooky part of it is everything above that um, could conceivably work. So if you take uh, you know, the brain, put it over here, and just provide it with blood flow, blood going in and blood going out, that brain could be, could be alive. So it was actually a head transplant more than a brain transplant. They cut the head off one monkey, put it on another monkey. So, the, so when the monkey woke up, he was actually you know, blinking his eyes and looking around and all of that. So, but but it, would be, it would be the other monkey, you know, the brain. It wouldn't be like you've transplanted the brain into a, into a different, and then that monkey becomes the other person. That's wild. Yes? Ma'am. Somebody's soul, yeah. Probably not the case. You're right. Yeah, <laughs> haven't thought this through. <laughs> um, what about the um, a, a very very young unborn baby, like a day after the day of conception, would have, according to the church, a, a, a full human soul, despite not having a full human brain at all at that point, physically speaking. Mm -hmm. What did that point to the soul? Being elsewhere, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it would not be a developed, a fully developed brain, but it still could be, you know, where the, you know, the, the, if you watch babies as they mature and as their brain becomes myelinated, they, these neurons are, are all there to begin with. You don't grow new neurons as you, as you age. The, the neurons just become myelinated. They, uh, so myelin is like the sheath of a, of a, wire. If you think of a copper wire that runs things, you, uh, but when the baby's born, there are, there are all these neurons, they're just not all completely covered with insulation, so they don't work normally. But, uh, you know, the, the brain develops, and you could say, you know, the soul develops, you know, with the, with the brain. I don't, know, I don't know that the church really has come down on when ensoulment happens either, right? It's, whether it's conception or quickening or, you know, the, it's not been dogmatic. Pronounced, yeah.